So keeping this train moving along, um, the next three sessions that we have, which we do have a break in between, we wanted to get into kind of a, a TED style speaking. So the LinkedIn speakers, we're going to go kind of rapid fire on about you know 15 minutes or so, maybe 20 minutes around some practical applications for these concepts and then bring a couple of clients up so that we're able to have a quick dialogue about how those specific clients have been utilizing these same tools and techniques. So what I'd like to do is start by having Jason Miller come up and join us on stage to give the first talk around how to keep customers coming back. Hi everyone, welcome to uh, Tech Connect 2014. Uh, I'm going to take a little bit. I'm going to do this a little bit differently. I'm not really um, into the traditional moderation of panels, but <clears throat> so I'm going to do a kind of game show style a little bit, right? But uh, I do want to tell a quick story. I just got back from <clears throat> content marketing world and inbound, so I had been on the road for like two weeks, a little a little frazzled still, <laughs> because I was flying into Cleveland for content marketing world, and. Um, <clears throat> I shoot concert photography, so I had all my camera gear and I had my laptop, and then I checked my every, everything else I had except for this heavy metal T-shirt I wore into Cleveland. And of course, everything I have to wear for my next speaking gigs at inbound and content market world are in this bag. And what happens? It gets it gets lost. United loses my bag. So, so I tweet out. I don't like to you know go after these people too hard because they get the crap beat out of them on social as it is. So I just tweeted out, "United lost my bag. Thanks a lot." And my buddy uh, Travis Wright. Super smart marketer, uh, tech marketer, tweets me back. He's like, oh my god, what are you going to do? What are you going to wear? You got to speak tomorrow first thing in the morning. I said, you know what? I said, Travis, I don't know what to do. I'm freaking out. So I went to this concert, and, and uh, the next morning I get to, to uh, Content Marketing World. Who's the first person I run into? Travis Wright. And he, I had this exact same shirt on. And he goes, Jesus Christ, what happened to you? Would you run over to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and raid the Allman Brothers exhibit? <laughs> yeah. I said, no, they, they, they found my bag and got it to me this morning. <laughs> <laughs> this is my shirt, Travis. Anyway, so with that being said, this session is called uh, How to Keep Your Customers Coming Back with uh, what we like to call an always-on content strategy. And I have uh, very happy to have with me um, Mr. Eric Martin here from uh, Catavolt. And Eric is the director of content marketing at Catavolt. And Catavolt, um, they build mobile apps to make your uh, employees more productive. Am I correct? Thank you for being here, Eric. And then my good friend David Spark from Spark Media Solutions. Uh, David does a little bit of everything, content creation consulting uh, is from Spark Media Solutions. So uh, we're going to go through, I'm going to introduce each topic. We have six topics today. And I'm going to introduce each topic with a couple of slides uh, and kind of give my point of view. And I'm going to pass it along to our, our uh, folks here on the panel and get, uh, get their viewpoints. And we'll take some questions at the end. So uh, with that being said, <clears throat> let me introduce you, take you back to 1977, right? Uh, why, and, and, and I'm building up to why why I think it's a good time to be a content marketer. This is John Travolta's Saturday Night Fever. This is the biggest selling soundtrack of all time, right? It was on the, the Billboard, it was number one on the Billboard chart for 24 weeks straight. 24 weeks, that is insane. So disco was all the rage, and that was all the media would cover, all the critics would cover this. Rolling Stone, everybody was covering disco, right? But <laughs> there was this little movement happening uh, in the UK and in New York where it was uh, punk rock, but punk rock could not get any coverage whatsoever because all the media was doing was paying attention to disco, right? So what they do? Well, bands like the Sex Pistols, the Clash, the Ramones, they all became, they had to become so outlandish that the media would have to pay attention to them. But they took it a step further, and <clears throat> this is my favorite quote from Jello Biafra, I'm the only person in LinkedIn history to quote Jello Biafra at an ABC, I'll tell you what, that really happened. But anyway, <laughs> Jello Biafra made this quote. Uh, don't hate the media, become the media because of what they went through, right? They didn't force the media, they couldn't get any media coverage, so what they do, they became their own media. And I think that's where we're at with content marketing right now, right? Why would you not want to own your conversation? Why would you not want to tell your own story? And, you know, a couple weeks ago, I was, I was on a panel, and this guy says, oh, the conversation's out there, and it's already being told, right? And I'm thinking to myself, he goes, oh, he goes, he goes why would I even want to be in there? And I said, why not just roll over and die then? Right? Because if you can't get out there and either tell the story better or take a unique angle on that story, then you're not a content marketer. You're not cut out to be a content marketer, right? Take the George Costanza approach. Whatever they're doing, do the exact opposite, right? <laughs> try that, but try something. You have to try something. And, and content marketing is the place where you can tell your story, right? And you can get started. No longer do you have the content farms are dead, the search engines killed them. 
Right? So no longer do you need to put out 150 blog posts a day to, to make an impact. You can start writing content today and make an impact this afternoon. Make a, make a, make a bigger impact in two weeks. Make a, a substantial impact and rank very high and drive lots of revenue and pipeline in six to months. I mean, it's crazy. So that's where I think we're at. And it goes into my first topic, <clears throat> which I know uh, David talked about and Mike Weir talked about. But it's about earning trust and credibility. And this is very top of the funnel, right? As uh, Jay Baer, the author of Utility, famously said, um, sell something, get a customer for a day, help someone get a customer for a lifetime. So top of the funnel, content, you're building relationships, you're earning trust. And uh, I'll pass it over to Eric. Eric, uh, your thoughts on, on the importance of using content to uh, earn trust and credibility. Well, I think it's, um, it's a must. I think the uh, gentleman earlier before who said that, um, you know, just be at least slightly relevant to me. Um, what you can do with that is, and if you understand someone's needs, you can open a conversation and they will, they will listen to you. If they have found that conversation to be thought-provoking, they'll actually interact. And I think once you actually earn someone's trust, I think that interacting with someone is a really good gauge of, of, uh, of earning trust, engagement with your content. Excellent, yeah, and I think we always forget, as marketers, we're sitting in front of our computer screen, we're writing, we're creating, we're promoting, we're in our market automation platform, but we forget that there's a human on, on the other end of that content. And so it begs the question of, of what makes good content. Well, it makes good content is, is useful, it's inspiring, it's, uh, sometimes it's entertaining, but it has to connect with that other person and it has to pull a trigger, right? It has to inspire them to take the next step in that journey. And uh, David, your thoughts on uh, trust and credibility? Uh, well, first of all, I'm going to move over there so I'm not so far away from you. <laughs> uh, but because uh, you're now standing up and you never decided to sit down. The, uh, uh, about three and a half years ago, I wrote a piece for Mashable uh, called about how to be an online influencer. And the core to that is uh, you can't be an influencer. You can't have credibility unless you're producing some kind of media or someone's producing media about you. Now, chances are if you're not already got some level of fame in your industry, no one's producing media about you, so you need to create something. So it's literally the only way you can create credibility is to create, like you said at the beginning, your own media. And um, the better you are at it, the more credible you can be. Yeah, and, and again, I think that goes on to the always on strategy, right? How much do you have to create? Uh, well, again, we're not in the camp of making more content. We're in the camp of making uh, the, the mind thought of, of making more relevant content, right? So, uh, and that goes into my next topic. This is what I call the big rock piece of content. Now, when I, uh, when I came to LinkedIn, there was one question uh, that, that, was, that was very popular. It was, uh, how do you market on LinkedIn? How do you market successfully on LinkedIn, right? So uh, I've been at LinkedIn almost a year. And um, the, I, I thought, you know, everybody talks about thinking like a publisher, right? That's kind of the trend. But it's still cliche at the same time. Because a pub, what a publisher does is they publish books. They publish, uh, they want to own their conversations. So uh, in order to take advantage of this very top of funnel question uh, that was being told by every other social media blog on the planet, they were taking our traffic, right? I wanted to get that back. But I wanted to answer that question better. From the, from the experts, uh, so we pulled together and we created the all-encompassing guide to whatever the hell conversation we wanted to own, which I recommend everyone do here, choose a topic, and that was how to market on, on LinkedIn, specifically the Sophisticated Marketer's Guide to LinkedIn, which I think everyone here has. But again, this is written strategically, not instructionally. This is not an instruction manual, because what happens when you get an instruction manual? Well, you, you throw it in the trash and you go to YouTube. But it had lots of third-party validation. This is a book, man. I, we wrote a book on how to market on LinkedIn from LinkedIn. You can publish, we could publish this thing on Amazon. We could sell this if we wanted to. But we give it away for free because we're always helping, right, instead of always selling. But this is how you own your conversation. This is the big rock. Uh, at Content Marketing World, this guy comes up to me, and he said, hey, man, I love your content. I love the fact uh, that, that you're making these big rock pieces of content, these definitive guides or whatever. He said, but there's too much value there. And I said, what the hell? Are you out of your mind? What, what marketer has ever downloaded a piece of content and said there's too much value here, I'd like to give this back to you? No marketer, right? It's insane. But he had a very short-sighted view of what we would do with that, what we, how we would repurpose this thing. One big rock piece of content can fuel demand gen and social for up to a quarter. And it's scalable. You know why it's scalable? Because you do this once, and then you choose the next conversation you want to own. And you do it better, bigger and better than anyone else out there. So that's my, uh, that's my thinking process on actually moving uh, from thinking like a publisher to actually publishing like a publisher. David, your thoughts? Uh, well, that's what we do. Uh, that's why we have a business. Uh, it's because we have clients who have only been thinking and they're not doing and 
you know, publishing takes a certain level of expertise and knowledge. I mean, I come back, I come from an 18 year, uh, I was an 18 year veteran tech journalist and producer in more than 40 media outlets and I started uh, the business Spark Media Solutions close to eight years ago uh, for the sole reason that I saw there were all these companies that were trying to tell their own story, either just not doing it or doing a very poor job of it. And so therefore we just started doing it. And, and you know, I, I will just ask this room right now quickly, is there anyone for which the content out of this conference is integral to the product that you guys sell? Anyone, is it, anybody, no? No, more sort of, if, so not, well, not that many, but if you're going to a conference where the content is <laughs> integral to the product you sell, you should be creating content out of that conference. Simply put, because conferences and trade shows are hyper-concentrated knowledge base on your industry, and if you capture that and then give it to your industry, that is how you build your brand I mean, it, and, and your thought leadership, and, and also connect, connect with influencers in the space. Yeah, and I think you know from the. It, I think when people think of publisher, they also think book publisher. And I must have pigeonholed that when I said that. But at the same time, you could think like a publisher as a magazine publisher, as a news reporter, like anyone here taking away five tips. You know, uh, I know Eric Whitlake back there, a good friend, super smart B two B marketer, taking notes, uh, always does great recaps and always brings along his great insights. Like he'll take these opinions that are up here on stage and he'll put his own spin on them and kind of analyze them, break them down. Uh, but in a very helpful manner, and you know, he's, he's, I, I consider him a thought leader in the space. He's, he's a brilliant content marketer. He's a brilliant B2B marketer. Um, and Eric, you guys do, uh, I, I checked out your content. Your blog's fantastic. Um, tell me your thoughts on, on, on how you guys uh, take that think like a publisher mentality and put it into play. Yeah, you know, I think um, it's, it's going beyond the editorial calendar, right? Because when you're a content marketer, I think that's, the, that's where you start. Is yeah. You start planning. You start thinking like a publisher. Um, you start um, understanding your audience, you know, and, and I think that um, it's, it's all it's kind of ties in back with the trust thing too. Um, once you created that big rock, um, once you've created that quality piece of content, um, now that you're a publisher, you have a responsibility to your audience to maintain the quality of your content, and I think that's the difference of between, or rather, the difference between thinking like a publisher and actually publishing, because you know, uh, uh, it's funny. The other uh, gentleman was talking about using. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, I think it was Christine who was talking about um, uh, actually using your employees to uh, generate content. Um, you know, that's great. What you need to do, though, is build the system and establish the tools and the processes that publishers actually use to make sure that that. That that deadline is met, that that content is published, that it's a, of a high quality, and that it has that kind of relevant, engaging message to your audience. So I think it's it's going beyond thinking; it's it's executing, yeah. really. You know, it's funny. Jesse Noyes from Capost, another uh, uh, content marketing friend of mine, uh, blurted out this comment the other day on a webinar. He said, "Don't create random acts of content." And I thought that was really clever, right? Because if you, I mean, every time that I publish something, or Deanna, who's on our team. Uh, every time we write a blog or we publish something, is there value to our, our audience here? And like Eric mentioned, it brings them back. It keeps them coming back. Once you establish that credibility and that trust, they're going to keep coming to you. If you turn that off, it's like you're abandoning your, you can your lose it very customers easily, or prospects. Yeah. yeah, you can lose it very easily. Yeah, and, and uh, another thing, Chris Brogan um, brought this up, and he's another term I love. I love analogies. Uh, I gotta uh, wait till you see the finale here. But uh, Chris Brogan talked about weaponizing your content. Right? When you, do you have, you have the, the worm, but do you have a hook in there? Right? Is there something besides a form or a call to action that, that is actually going to hook them and keep them coming back? Right? So uh, weaponizing your content, I think there's a blog post coming there. So um, <laughs> moving right along. This, now, this, back to my story about content marketing guy with a short-sighted vision. Right? What he didn't realize is I would take that big rock piece of content and using uh, Rebecca Leibs, you're wondering why the hell is there a turkey here? Rebecca Leib's turkey analogy. Rebecca Leib, one of the smartest content marketers on the planet from the Altimeter Group. Uh, years ago, when I didn't know anything about content marketing, I sat down and interviewed Rebecca. And I said, asking for uh, the general <laughs> public as much as myself, because I didn't know, what is your advice to give to these customers uh, or, or businesses who don't have enough content to fuel their demand gen and their social strategies? And she says, well, look around the content you have and think about your content like turkey. Like, like Thanksgiving, you get this big, beautiful bird. By the way, this doesn't work in APAC, I figured out. I've learned that very quickly, or the UK. You get this big, beautiful bird, and then what are you doing for the next 30 days? You're chopping, you're slicing and dicing this thing into 
you know, turkey sandwiches, turkey soup. You're making things out of turkey you probably shouldn't be making, but you're being efficient, right? And you're, you're, using, uh, <laughs> you're using this thing to its full extent. The other analogy I got in a little bit of trouble with was the Tony Soprano analogy for your content, where is where you strangle the hell out of it until you can't get any more life, and then you bury it in the desert and move on. No good? I'll, I'll <laughs> can't take that back now, but I'll work on it. So, but anyway, so repurposing that one big rock piece of content, we could, I think we got 27 different assets out of it. We chopped that into blog posts, slide presentations, infographics, webinars, videos, all these things to go into fuel our content hubs on LinkedIn, right? So not only were we creating a big rock piece of content to answer you know, our customers and prospects' questions and the burning question of how do I market on LinkedIn, but now we're going to turn that into our own best case study to prove that marketing solutions works, right? So repurposing that thing, coming up with these little teaser things that like David Thacker mentioned, these teaser, these little tentacles out there that are ungated will bring them back to the big rock piece of content. This is what it looks like. And again, don't overcomplicate this stuff, right? There are, <laughs> there are waterfall, uh, uh, plans out there or models that look like uh, plans for a nuclear reactor, right? This is what it comes down to. You got the turkey slices, non-gated, uh, going into the big rock. If they're not ready to consume your big rock, if they're not ready to give you that info right up front, that email address, you got to nurture them a little bit, right? Um, and so you go across campaigns, different pieces of content. And the beautiful thing is, by the way, this is, anyone can create this. We have two people on our content marketing team. We created this with a little bit of help from outside agencies. Um, but again, these, these turkey slices at the top, they're already created, right? We just lifted them out of the guide. We got 56 pages to work with, man. That's enough to fuel for an entire quarter. Uh, and then we have the simple nurture, nurture, MQL, SDR, sales, revenue, game over, right? So, um, gentlemen, I'll start with you this time, Eric. Always on nurturing with content. Uh, I know you guys have had success with this. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we have a highly uh, integrated way that we work with our content nurturing program. We, uh, you know, we have the traditional marketing automation, um, you know, drip programs and logic in, in place and all that good stuff. But, um, you know, one, one way that we actually go beyond that is to, is to really tightly integrate our uh, sales development um, with our content. Uh, we, we, go, we have workshops that educate them about the content that we have. Uh, you know, we have a very uh, kind of unique uh, uh, product, which I will not pitch, um, <laughs> but uh, we, it appeals to many different kinds of very specific audiences. Uh, for instance, uh, manufacturing operations professionals in the mechanical and industrial engineering industry. You know, very niche audience, um, you know, one that's uh, actually quite engaged with our content. Um, but in order to develop that relevant message and keep it relevant throughout nurturing, you need to educate the, the, you know, the, in, the entire marketing team about that content, the message and the audience, and, and sales development so that when they are um, reaching out and nurturing these people trying to push them through, you know, the message stays relevant and it stays, uh, stays of a high quality. Yeah, uh, a follow-up question just kind of um, I was thinking about, is it more difficult or is it easier when you get to a specific audience, like a niche like that? I mean, is it, because I think of it two ways, right? Like, you know exactly what to talk about, you know exactly what to, to create, and get into trending content, little plug there, figure out what they're talking about, right? Or um, it could be more difficult to get enough content, you know, different uh, varieties of content in there. What, what's your thoughts on that? Um, you know, that's a good question. I mean, obviously there's the scale. Um, when you're dealing with a finite audience, um, you know, the, that audience is there. So when you create that content, it has to be of a, um, of a high quality or you could lose them very quickly. You could lose that trust. Um, so I think that maybe uh, scaling that uh, beyond that, um, that target group, um, you know, when you go hyper-relevant with your messaging, you have the risk of alienating a lot of other uh, parts of your audience. But, you know, if it, if it works, it works. I think that scale would probably be the biggest, the biggest challenge there. Got it. And David, uh, on the topic of nurturing your audience, and, you know, this could be nurturing, you know, in a uh, tract of, of folks you already have in your database, or it could be, you know, multi-nurture uh, at the very top of the funnel to anonymous users, right? So, David, you do a great job repurposing content. Um, can you tell me a little bit about your strategy and where you see the yeah, success? Yeah, so... I should point out that the majority of clients who come to us who've never worked with us before, who are thinking two thirds of what we do is video. And, and I, by the way, I'm gonna be shooting a video after this and we'll talk about it at the end. Um, and they'll come and a very, very common opening question is, so what does it cost to make a video? Or what, what's, what does it cost? Which is a, a classic, you know, how long is a piece of string question? Because it can be literally anything. <laughs> um, and I always say, you're asking the most expensive question. Because to shoot just one video and only have one video as an output, 
is A, risky because you're putting your bet on just one piece of content, and B, you're not um, extending your reach and not um, extending your, the, your cost per unit, or excuse me, reducing your cost per unit. So what we'll do is one of our most common styles of videos, we do these kind of man on the street style videos where I ask one question of everybody and we slice it up very quickly and make a fun little two minute package. Well, in a single video, we may have 20 people responding to a single question. Well, each quote is a sort of a, is an idea in itself. All 20 together makes a nice video. We can take each quote and a still from that video and turn it into what we call a meme photo. You've seen these on, on all the social networks and they're highly, highly traded, photo with text on it. So now, from a single video, we add 20 pieces of content on top of it, which are 20 still photos, which we can then tag to maybe a person's Twitter handle or even their Facebook or LinkedIn account and then they see it and then they share it with their friends. Now we have this, what I call, architected virality. So now these tentacles, like what you're saying, it's, it's reaching out even further and further because people are happy to share things themselves are in. And then on top of it, we'll also turn it into a slide share presentation, which ironically will often get more views than the actual video itself and does unbelievably well in SEO. So now what was originally just a single piece of content, one video, can turn into 22 pieces of content, which with far more reach and touch and shareability than that one video. Do you call it turkey slices? What do you guys call it? I, we know we, we, I mean, we just call it, you know, it, it, you know, slicing up your content, but in general, that's why there's, it's, it's very analogous. Are you going to start using the turkey slices? I am, I'm and I'm gonna quote you. Thank you. Slices Thank you. Too, yeah. Rebecca Lee, by the way. <laughs> I need more, a more global analogy, <laughs> so if anyone has any suggestions, please find me afterwards. So um, coming up, we got three more topics here. So this is, um, Rob Reiner interviewing Mr. Nigel Tufnell and, uh, in, the, in the movie Spinal Staff, which I hope everyone in the, in the room has seen. Uh, and he's asking him, why do his amps go to 11? And Nigel famously says, well, we're on stage and we need that extra push over the cliff, right? And you're on 10, where can you go? Nowhere. So when they need that extra push over the edge, they, they turn it up to 11. And Rob Reiner says, why don't you just make 10 louder? He said, well, because this is one louder. <laughs> You guys kill me today. I thought that was a good one. <laughs> anyway, so the idea there, the idea there is we're diving into uh, native advertising, right? So um, again, this is native advertising. This is a sponsored update from a, uh, a little startup called Pantheon here in San Francisco, who I think does a remarkable job. With one content marketer, they made their own big rock and their turkey slices, and they're killing it. So check these guys out. They're doing a really remarkable job on, on, uh, on LinkedIn with their content. But the idea is, you know, there's folks out there who will tell you that inbound marketing is all you need, right? And I tell you that's ridiculous, right? Inbound marketing alone is like hanging out with the same group of high school kids your entire life. And I don't want to do that. I hated high school. I don't want to go back to that mentality, right? But <laughs> if you want to break through that audience, your initial audience, and get beyond, right, the connections, the secondary connections, you need to put some paid behind it. And that's where native advertising comes in. And <laughs> David's about to jump out of his chair here because he's got a few things to say about native advertising. But again, this is the future, man. It's 2014, moving into 2015. If you don't have you know, dedicated budget for content and social and to pay to promote your own good content, right, this is where we're headed to, then you're missing opportunities. Uh, and with the targeting capabilities and the native feel, it's forcing us to become better marketers because as David mentioned, if you're not relevant, and Eric mentioned as well, if you're not relevant, uh, you're going to lose that audience, right? So um, native advertising, in my opinion, is, is the best thing. It's the social media marketer's dream because it's advertising that doesn't look like advertising. Uh, and again, it forces us to be better marketers. Um, so David, I'm going to start with you, man, because uh, I, you have some opinions on native my, advertising. My sole, my sole opinion on it is it is the worst branded effort by the ad industry. Native advertising out of the gate is being treated like crap. Everyone by default assumes that all native advertising content is shit, and it is not. <laughs> it is, it, and, and you've probably all seen that John Oliver take he did, which was very, very funny, is good, but prior to native advertising in traditional journalism, there has been plenty, plenty of cases where Press releases are being released as traditional journalism with zero disclosure whatsoever. And someone somewhere has decided that by default, if it's native advertising, it has to suck. And I just, I'm just so fed up with how poorly this has been branded. How do you really it's feel good. I'm a, fan, no, I'm, I'm a fan of the concept. I'm just not a fan of how badly it's been introduced. 
And that's my aggravation with it. Um, I mean, you guys have all seen this. Just the, the press on native advertising is horrific. Well, you know, and it's, you bring up a good point because the press, Nielsen came out with this report that said uh, PR kicks branded content's ass once again. And you see all these, these PR people like celebrating. And I'm going, what, what the hell's the matter with you? That's completely the wrong mentality. Mm -hmm. PR people are, are there any PR people in here? <laughs> they, are, they are frightened of native advertising because now you can get your story. You can pitch your story without pitching your story, without it looking like a pitch. So, uh, and, and I wrote this, this, this kind of thing saying why PR and, and, and content and social should be working together. These people should be having happy hours together. They shouldn't be all siloed. Wait till you see my analogy on the end that pulls us all together. But Eric, your thoughts on native advertising. Have you guys had success with this? Um, oh, yeah, I mean, sponsored updates are, are tremendous. Um, you know, for us, um, I didn't they, tell them to say that, by the way. That's, yeah, no, that's no, organic really, right that, there. That wasn't prompted. Uh, <laughs> it's a tremendous product. Um, you know, it helps us a lot. Um, I, do, I do share some of the uh, reservations, maybe not as strongly. Um, I, I do think that marketers have a responsibility to keep the quality of um, sponsored content and the native content high. I think um, readers are smart. Um, I think that they're smarter um, than we uh, sometimes let on. Uh, with low effort content, you're, what you're saying is your audience is dumb and they are not. Um, this went back to that um, post that I had on LinkedIn the other day about uh, top list content. Um, I, I, th I, think that, um, I think that as long as you are delivering a high quality relevant message, and I think that you've got to be clear that you're not fooling them. There's got to be a good level of disclosure, I think. Which, uh, by the way, is this is the big issue on yeah. the whole native advertising. Yeah. People claim by default no one's disclosing, yet if you look at every, I'm sorry, every single case of yeah. native advertising, it is disclosed. The worst <clears throat> case of it all is New York Times. It has not one, not two, but 12 different disclosures that the content is not New York Times editorial content. Mm. It is the worst presentation. I don't know how any salesman sells it because it's garbage. <laughs> it's so bad. There's good so, salespeople out there. Well, <laughs> Dell bought it, by the way. <laughs> I know there's some folks from Dell here. So. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> Eric, you brought up this post. Eric wrote this really interesting post uh, published on LinkedIn, as, as I hope you all are uh, publishing on LinkedIn. Um, it was about, uh, and I, have, I, have, I agree, but I disagree, right? Your audience is, of course, smart, but top lists, if I'm, in a, if I'm on the go, if I'm in the line of Starbucks, uh, I don't go to Starbucks, I go to the local, anyway. But the, uh, yeah. if I'm, I want something fun and, and, and quick and like something insightful, I like a list, man. I know yeah. David, we were talking about this too. Like David, the stats, right, the stats? I would just say, well, explain what your article is about before it's, we well, go into this. this. It's a bit of a contrarian viewpoint. It's, mm -hmm. it's the viewpoint that you shouldn't rely on lists. And I think that, that there's marketers out there that are relying on top list content too much. Um, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> you know, I mean, we, we, have, we have top list content on our blog uh, mm -hmm. every now and then, uh, but you know, I think that maybe it's just a mentality, maybe it's just um, trying to instill the mentality in marketers to not get complacent, uh, not figure out a tool um, that works and just stick with it. Always challenge yourself to get better. Um, just like with, uh, with native advertising, um, if, if we rely on one form of, of message delivery, consumers will get smart, they'll tune it out. Um, and I think that's something that we always have to watch out for. Yeah, and, and, but I love the post. It's a great post. It's on his profile. You guys should check it out. But, uh, but I love it because you took, you, call, you basically called it out. And you took a very, uh, uh, we call it Tabasco content in the blogging food groups, if you guys know that. But uh, you, you took a stance, and you took a very strong opinion, and you called somebody out. So I, I, like, that, I like that angle. Uh, you should make a list of the top call outs. Ah, but but, nice. but I, I would always <laughs> say there are, reasons, there are good lists sucks. and bad lists. You know, do a generic, sure. like, top 10 things to do whatever. And you will notice 20 people writing the same exact top 10 list. I, would, I, I, would, I, I made a reference to, to John Oliver's show. If anyone saw the very last one where he kind of went after the, um, the Miss America pageant, who had this completely <clears throat> bogus statistic that 45 million, uh, they provide 45 million in scholarships to women, and then they actually dug into it and found that the, the stat was as bogus as bogus gets. That's the kind of thing as you as, a, as an industry need to find. What is that one thing that nobody's reporting that will blow the lid off that everyone will pay attention? It's not about writing 150 posts. It's finding that one thing and putting the massive effort. They put crazy effort into you know, investigating this. And this is what's so impressive about the show is how deep the investigative team is for a comedy program. Mm. And that's kind of the, the way you have to develop content is just sort of find that one thing and that one thing's gonna change all the time 
to blow the lid off that the whole audit, your whole industry talks about it. And everyone was talking about that. It was phenomenal. Excellent. Um, yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And, and the bigger question is, how do you find that? Well, that's It's work. It's an effort, <laughs> like anything. <laughs> So um, this is uh, my next topic. Uh, we got two more left here. Is is treating your content, uh, your big rock content, like a product launch, right? So instead of just putting it out there and saying, "Hey, everybody," and then then emailing the company, right? That's not how we do it. I call this the bat out of hell approach. Now, work with me here, people. I came up with this uh, the other day on a plane. So the idea here is bat out of the hell, bat out of hell came out in '78. Uh, and it's one of the biggest selling records in recorded history. Now, why is that? Because, because the record label came out all guns blazing, which I think you should take the same approach with your content, right? So you gotta be everywhere. This record consistently sells thousands of copies each week because it's always on, just like that always on content strategy. If, this, if you did not buy this record in 1978, 79, you will get it because they will retarget you, Meatloaf will go on tour, he will be on the late show, Amazon will retarget you, you will get this record, before you die, I promise you. <laughs> so, um, but anyway, so when we launched the, uh, the Sophisticated Marketer's Guide, we had everything lined up and we had everybody ready to go out of the gate. You gotta make a big impact. So I say for those about to launch, I, uh, we salute you, you guys are killing me, man. No, no. <laughs> Let me get the ACDC. Anyway, so as we're proving that marketing on LinkedIn works with our own best big rock piece of content, we were everywhere, we were email, blog, in-mail, company pages, slide share, et cetera, et cetera. We even used a little thing called Twitter. Um, but, but I'm going to share you some results, right? These are the results out of the gate from guns, all guns blazing. This is the first two weeks. Now, if you look at that, what's really interesting about this is the global reach, which would, we, this thing is now in four different languages, right? We're scaling this thing always on, still kind of uh, uh, hammering home that this thing is still a piece of relevant content. But what's even more interesting is, of course, email was the number one first two weeks, right? Because it came out with a big blast to email. Uh, but what would, you, what would happen a couple of months after that is the blog with the turkey slices coming out, the rolling thunder approach on the blog. Now, then the blog became the number one resource. And then finally, just a couple weeks ago, sponsored updates slash native advertising became the number one driver of, of leads, of marketing qualified leads driving into revenue. This is crazy stuff. This is one piece of content that's been going since January. It's driven over $4.6 million in, rev in, in business, right? In booked, in, 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 this is cr a crazy number, which leads to I call it face melting ROI. <clears throat> this is Mr. Ingve Momstein. As I'm researching face melting, I found that there are only uh, uh, two gentlemen who can actually do face melting, uh, Mr. Eddie Van Halen and uh, Mr. Jimi Hendrix. But there is only one documented case of an actual face melting, and that's at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark. <laughs> no good? <laughs> anyway, one piece of content. The big rock piece of content, the relevant own our conversation, 18,000% ROI, that's one piece of content, always on, turkey slices, all this stuff coming together, right? Uh, and, it's, and we're going to scale it when we go into the next one, when I franchise this out. So, uh, Eric, let's start with you. Treating your, uh, your content, your big content initiatives uh, like a product launch instead of just throwing it out there. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's, uh, I think like you said, it starts with the turkey slices. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, no, it starts with the turkey, the big rock, then you cut up the turkey slices. I mean, I think it's about, um, it's about announcing it. It's about involving your, your company, everyone that's customer facing or possibly customer facing in your company. Um, really, really rallying around it, creating a theme, a flag that everyone can, can unite under. Um, I, I think it's about, um, creating a kind of piece of content that um, uh, that can that can live on its own. I think we were discussing this earlier. Creating that, uh, like uh, the Khan Academy, he created a um, uh, piece of content that kind of became self-aware. Um, <laughs> it, it became its. It, it was so powerful and so engaging um, that he didn't even have to market it for it to become successful. All of a sudden, you know, Bill Gates is up, up, on, up on stage talking about it. So, you know, making it, making it a product launch, also making an extremely high quality product that can, that can propel itself, I think is, and it's, you know, not, a, not an easy thing to do. You know, you mentioned uh, when we were just we were chatting about this earlier, the uh, the, the often important uh, step that I that I as a content marketer forget um, sometimes is is the sales enablement element of this. Yeah. Is this content can this content be used internally as for as much as externally, right? Uh, and and how do you guys handle that with with your content, Eric? Well, I mean, you know, when we when we have new content that comes out, it's uh, every it's uh, dropped into a notification system where all of our sales team is notified of it. You know, they get that. 
they get that notification to reach out to their customers with new pieces of content. They don't have to wait around for us to uh, you know, send, it, send it to email through everyone. You know, the, the content is there in a repository. Um, you know, they're aware of, a, of an effort. You know, we, don't, we don't just drop content in there and see, see how it goes. These are all very coordinated, concerted efforts where we have a campaign going to a specific persona, a specific target, and you know, we, we attack uh, accordingly. Excellent, David. Uh, David, you, David makes some fantastic eBooks, and whenever you launch one of your eBooks, man, I can't, I can't get away from it. It's everywhere. It's on every channel. It's chasing me around, right? So but he does a great job. Give me a breakdown of, of so your strategy there. He was quoted in our. Uh, Jason was quoted in our last one. That's why he saw it. Uh, <laughs> the uh, but we're actually our whole thing with the eBooks is how can we distribute it as much as possible and and get it out to as many people and let as many people know about it that would be of interest to this. And the other thing, which is, this is what I call about architecting virality, the more people you quote in a piece of content, the higher your chances are that it will pass along and become very, very viral. Um, I write these sort of mega articles for IDG that have between 20 to 40 people quoted in a single article. and. It's not just writing the article, it's the follow-up process that I do afterwards where I let them know, hey, you've been quoted in it, but more importantly, I follow up with the people who were quoted in it and apologize for not quoting them <laughs> and say, I'm gonna need you for the next article, please don't hate me for not quoting you, I wanna use you for the next, because I write these all the time. These articles consistently get hundreds and hundreds of shares and they do very, very well because the sole reason, one is, if I got 40 people quoted, I can guarantee it's gonna get a bare minimum 40 shares. More importantly, if I get 40 well-known people who have a social platform, it's gonna get a lot more shares. Then I apologize to people who I didn't include and they're like, well, I was interested in this content to begin with, <laughs> I'll share it anyways. So it gets more and more shares like that and it goes on and on and on. So that's just, I'll just blatantly tell you, that is one, crazy successful technique that we've done over and over and over again, and it works. It is not as easy as it sounds, so it's an insane amount of work. I'll just, I mean, just to give you an idea, <laughs> this latest one I'm working on right now, which I'm gonna finish, I have, I got about 200 responses, and it was like over 100, well, about 75, 80 pages worth of just notes on it, just period. So, and it's gonna be boiled down to a 3,000 word article. So it's, in, it's kind of insane sometimes what you have to deal with. Yeah, we call that ego baiting, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, and, and in the in the big, the big rock con pieces of content we create, sophisticated marketers guide. There's quotes throughout there as well. And at the end, it's really funny. At the end, uh, I put together a list of the top social media experts, and the the people are like, what's the uh, algorithm you used? I was like, these are people that I like who I think are smart. <laughs> I put them in a list. It works, right? So, um, anyway, and my final point here. Now, uh, this, this is about organizing for the always on, how to build that content engine, how to keep it always on, how to keep it well oiled, uh, how to structure your team to do that, right? So um, this comes from a conversation I had at Blue Glass with uh, Brian Clark from Copyblogger, one of the smartest content marketers on the planet as well. And Brian, we were sitting there having a cocktail and he told me, he goes, I just restructured my entire team, which is, you know, Brian's got a pretty small business, but he actually took uh, SEO, content, social, PR, and demand gen, and put them all in the same spot. So they were sitting there, there's no silo, they're communicating. And then I was photographing Kiss, and then uh, on a plane ride home, and I came up with this idea. So, this is the modern marketing team of 2015, <laughs> right? Kiss figured this shit out 40 years ago. What you have is you have, oh, you have all these folks sitting together, no silos, and then you have the most important thing right there, the Kiss army, which is their community. Now, let me walk you through this. You got four unique band members on stage playing different instruments, different roles, but all coming together to play pleasing music, heavy metal music, right? Well, pleasing to some of us. Uh, but the idea here is to have SEO, you got Mr. Peter Chris back there laying the backbeat, right? Laying the foundation. SEO lays the groundwork of your content, your social, your website. They're, they're optimizing, right, for you to be found. Then he goes into Mr. Paul Stanley. Star Child, he's out there in the front. He's your, he's your face, man. He's out there talking about your brand. He's fueling content, but he's also saying, hey, this is working. These people are talking about this. And then that goes into Mr. Gene Simmons. Gene writes all the songs. He sings all the goddamn songs. I'm sorry, I get so excited talking about this. <laughs> he's the content core, man. He f now, now Gene here, now Gene fuels Mr. Ace Freely, who's on lead guitar, or whoever's playing Ace Freely these days. I think Tommy Thayer. But the idea here is all these people communicating because content 
fuels demand gen, and demand gen says, hey, this is working more. We need more of this type of content. So content's like, okay, cool. We're going to test it out with social a little bit. Paul, what's working? Uh, and, then, and then Peter Chris over here is saying, hey, you got to optimize all this stuff before you put it out there, right? So all these guys sitting together, communicating, working together. If you have, the bigger the company, it seems like the bigger the silo. If you can't break these down and have these people communicating, then you're missing opportunities. It's that, it's that simple. So, oh, and I forgot, Mr. Doc McGee, their PR guy sits with the content team because he's out there. When you have influencers in marketing and you have analysts in marketing and you have like the social guys talking to the influencers, but he's also talking to the analysts. And then you have the PR who's talking to the analysts and then the media. There's too much overlap to not have these people sitting together. Um, so you got to have all these people talking to one another. There's too much overlap and they're fueling each other. They're fueling each other's success. It's all based on the kiss thing, right? And their big rock piece of content is an album every two years. Their event marketing is when they go on tour. It's a beautiful thing. Poke somebody, poke a hole in this, please. <laughs> anyway, David, we'll start with you. Uh, what, how do you, how do you uh, sustain this content engine that, uh, that you've built? Uh, you have to have a production schedule. I mean, that's the bottom line. Uh, and that, anyone who tries to start doing this uh, falls through. I will say one of the issues that we've had with clients is there's this fear of, um, of letting up control, giving up control of their, their publishing platforms, and they all say, oh, no, no, we'll publish it, we'll publish it, but they don't have a production schedule in place. And I will say, in almost every single case, it falls by the way, say, they don't let, they, don't, they just don't have their systems in place to publish it. So I'll just say is, you gotta have a publishing schedule and you have to adhere to it. Like, you know, there's a, there's a very famous quote from Lauren Michaels of uh, Saturday Night Live. He says, we don't put on Saturday Night Live because it's a great, it's a perfect show. Like, you know, when they put it on, we put it on because it's 11.30 p.m. on Saturday night. <laughs> and and it's, it's, he said this many, many times. That's the bottom line. You got to adhere, whatever your schedule is, whatever you do, you have to adhere to it and maintain it and keep that machine going. And that just becomes your job of releasing stuff. Um, and if you don't do that, then you're not seen as a consistent brand and not something that people can rely on. People rely on Saturday Night Live because they know it's going to be on Saturday nights at 11.30 p.m. When, when the season's going. And you have to let your brand do that as well in terms of whatever you do in how you publish. And it may not be on specific times, but it may be a certain amount of quantity, quantity of content or a quality of content. You just have to adhere to it and get it out. Well said. And, and Eric, we were talking earlier, you have uh, six people, you said, on your marketing team. How do you yeah. structure this, uh, this content engine that you have? Um, well, you know, it's interesting. It's, <clears throat> it's everyone has, you know, we all kind of have that shared authority um, to, to get things done. Um, you know, we have a, a little bit of a unique way in that we work and that we don't, um, we do have a production schedule and a, and a calendar, um, but we work in a agile fashion, uh, much like agile developers do, where we actually have two-week sprints. We have retrospectives. Uh, so we'll meet on a day and then, uh, you know, assign each person the task that they need to get done in that two-week period. At the end of the two weeks, we have a retrospective. We see what worked. We see what didn't. Um, establishing this rhythm, you know, an engine is, in a gas engine anyway, is measured in, you know, revolutions per minute, right? And if you build that kind of rhythm and cadence to looking at your data, making sure that campaigns are being productive, uh, making sure you're working on the right content, um, and having that kind of shared authority to get things done rather than just, uh, you know, have a strategic plan for the year and, and hope that, that everyone adheres to that schedule because things change. Um, so I think uh, thinking a little differently and maybe considering a more, a more agile way to work uh, might be a good way to sustain it. Perfect. What do you think of my KISS analogy? Awesome. Thank I, you. I actually Thank think you. that, um, you know, I saw the Gene, uh, the, the lead singer from ACDC, he was wearing a vest with no shirt. Maybe, maybe next time. That's what I wore at Inbound. <laughs> uh, and so I'm going to wrap it up here. Uh, thank you, uh, gentlemen, for, uh, for your sharing your insights. But uh, this is a quote from Mr. Paul Stanley. I took this photo. He was right in my face, like right here. right. And um, I, I think we forget this sometimes, the content marketers, because uh, we, we are here. Uh, B2B marketing has traditionally been boring. Uh, we all know that, right? And, and B2C has always been fun. But it's time to switch, switch things up. 
flip this on its head. B2B marketers like to have fun. B2B marketing can be sexy as well. Uh, you just need to add a little personality into it. Hire a comedian, for Christ's sake, right? I don't know. Uh, but Mr. Paul Stanley said, uh, people want a thrill, people want a spectacle, and people love to be entertained. So uh, when you're creating content, even for a boring, boring, boring B2B product, if you think it's that boring, uh, there's always ways to spice it up. So uh, look to KISS, and if KISS doesn't work, ask yourself, what would Jerry Seinfeld do? And uh, <laughs> oh, I want to mention the thing. And uh, David will be doing a quick Man on the Street video. We have one question, David. Do you want to yeah, tell? Yeah. So uh, uh, during the break and during the cocktail party, I'm going to be actually shooting a video for LinkedIn, and I want everyone to be thinking about this question because I'm going to bring a camera on you, and hopefully you'll have a great answer for me. So here's the question I want you to think about. Don't say it out loud. Keep it in your head. And the question is, because we've been talking about innovative ways to do marketing and stuff, so I want you to think if you had no limits whatsoever. There were no limits in, in, in your business in terms of financial, political, or in terms of you know, being conservative you know, or not. There were no limits whatsoever. How would you like to be doing tech marketing? All right, and I just want to get your answer to that on camera. So be think, please be thinking about that, and uh, you'll see me with the camera and a LinkedIn microphone, and love to get your answer. And do it after a couple of drinks. I think that'd be fun. <laughs> and one last plug, sorry, Mike. Uh, this is my book coming out on Halloween. Welcome to the funnel. Uh, all about B2B uh, content strategies at the top of the funnel. Hopefully Guns N' Roses won't sue me and it's available to pre-order <laughs> now. So, um, and that's it, thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks. Awesome. That was awesome. awesome, man. Thank you. Eric, Thanks, man. fantastic, thank you. Mike, awesome. thanks buddy. Thank you. All right, so we are now in the final stretches and uh, we're gonna take a quick break about 15 minutes, bring everybody back. We have about an hour of content left after that before we then adjourn for cocktails. It's worth it, stick with us. Totally understand, appreciate everybody giving a whole day. Enjoy the break, fill out your event survey which is at your chair as well, and we'll be back in 15 minutes. Thank you. <laughs>